Anyway, here is our speaker. He promises to be short and provocative. <laughs> right, okay, although he's tall, really. Um, so there you are. Hello, and uh, welcome to my talk. My name's Amran. Um, a bit of background about me. I was involved with the London Hack Space a few years ago now, I think. I was one of the kind of core participants there. Um, and then I moved on to Amsterdam and helped found a hackerspace there called Tech Inc. Um, as well as being involved in the EMF organization for 2012 uh, this year and for Observe Hack Make in Holland last year. Um, so I've kind of been around in the various organizations and types of organizations within the hacker scene. Seen a bit, done quite a lot, um, and I thought I'd kind of share my view a little bit on where we are in, in terms of diversity and, and expanding our little scene to um, other people who, sh who should, I think, have access to it just as much. Um, but I'm going to concentrate on the UK because that's where we are. Um, the UK has about 50 hacker spaces, maybe a little bit more now, I'm not quite sure. Um, we have one major event every two years called Electromagnetic Field, of course, um, and, and that event is largely run by people who uh, are involved with hackerspaces in the UK. The concept of hackerspace is, uh, if you take it kind of at a high level, it's been around for a while, probably since the 60s, uh, born out of the, the hippie movement. Um, they're pretty mainstream now. We kind of make it into various newspapers across Europe, at least. Um, Snowden really blew that kind of thing wide open across the world and there are many, many articles, j the journalists write stuff, researchers as well. Um, so we're not like kind of an underground scene anymore, we're not some secret squirrel club that's really, you know, unique and brilliant. We're, we're widely accessible by a, a large part of the public. Um, there's quite a, there's, there is a quite a discussion on whenever you ask somebody what's a hackerspace, there's, there's like a three-day discussion about what and what it does not include. But I, <laughs> but I think there are two aspects which most people can agree on. Firstly, it's a shared resource for all the people who are members of that hackerspace. Um, things like tools, a physical place to have workshops. And the second aspect is uh, skills and knowledge sharing. You go there and you meet people, and you meet people from different backgrounds who do different things, whether it's in uh, electronics or radio or programming or woodworking. Metalworking, I mean, if, especially if you go to places like London, which has like a thousand members now, there's quite a varied uh, skill set you can find there. And generally, you can start a conversation up with people and you can start to kind of understand their world and understand that particular skill or area of knowledge. And in that respect, they're, they're quite little handy places. Unfortunately, I think hacking these days is, um, is more of a privilege than anything else. Um, it's the hacker scene is possibly less diverse than the tech sector, which, as we know, is very male orientated. Um, it's a bit of an achievement in itself, and I've wondered for a long time why that is and what kind of aspect of a hacker space or the, or the general movement as a whole is causing that. And if you look to other countries out of, outside of um, Europe, places like India uh, tend to have a higher proportion of female engineers as students than uh, places like the UK or America. And for me, that suggests there's a possible cultural problem here. Uh, with the scene itself, both in the tech scene and the hacker scene. Um, and the, the real kind of tricky bit is, well, we have hacker spaces and we, we advertise them openly to everybody. Why shouldn't they appeal to everybody? But why isn't everybody turning up? And I, I, I think it is down to cultural problems. Um, and there's a few, and this is not all of them, and this is not even some of them. Um, and they vary from place to place. You're going to find different problems with different people. A lot of it is personal. A lot, some of it is political. Um, one of the main ones that gets kind, of, gets kind of shoved in the corner is harassment. And I'm not talking about the kind of sexual harassment where uh, a, f a female member comes in with a burrito and some kind of offhand joke is made about it. I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? That's a bit of a dick thing to do. But there's a lot of so subtle harassment where, for instance, um, I've been targeted by an individual over a year, maybe more, everything I've said everything I've suggested has been kind of taken down or brought down a level. 
um, just because they they have a particular problem with me that they're not willing to kind of solve. But it doesn't just it's not just interpersonal as well. It can spread to a group, and a group can kind of um, affect a whole community within the hacker space in, in that sense. And one of the uh, good examples of that is is uh, the women's only nights at Tech Inc was a kind of a victim of that. And I'm sure there's lots of other examples in other hackerspaces, but I'm not going to talk about hackerspaces that I wasn't involved in. So, the non-obvious harassment is really tricky to deal with, not only to kind of identify as a problem, but it's also to kind of solve. And I'm not going to try and suggest too many solutions here. Today, I just want to talk about how we can recognize the problems that we have. There's also a level of entitlement that comes with certain sectors of uh, community in a hackerspace. You have the people who volunteer quite readily. They do a lot of infrastructure work, maybe. Um, and people who don't want to get involved with the kind of messiness will give them a bit of a pass if they get into a bit of trouble because, you know, or that person, they always help out. They always do something. So it's kind of okay. They're not doing any kind of harm. In fact, they've done a little bit of good. But harassment can affect people quite... Uh, personally at a very kind of uh, deep level without you even realizing it, especially with hackerspaces attracting people who are not, not necessarily, um, who are not necessarily, how to phrase this, people who are kind of sensitive or maybe having some uh, mild mental health difficulties. We, I'm sure we all know people like that within the space that we kind of frequent. Um, and, this, and this kind of entitlement kind of leads, len, leans into another aspect, which is the tyranny of the structuralist, which is an essay written about the feminist movement back in the uh, 60s, I think it was, um, where you have power structures because people have a knowledge which isn't shared or they're in charge of a process which isn't written down. And they are the gatekeepers. And they, suddenly you have a cabal uh, of people who, if you get on their bad side or if you annoy them a tiny little bit, suddenly you're, you're, you begin to become ostracized from um, being, ha being able to have access to those particular uh, things that these people are in charge of. And the people in charge can also develop some bad habits, like using confrontation to establish their hierarchy. Um, it happens a lot in the wider community, certainly. People like Jake Applebaum, who's almost famous for doing that, standing up in the middle of a lecture and uh, insulting and harassing and accusing people who are talking about whatever his project is at the time. And there's also a massive sense of elitism as well, which is when you go into a space and you want to learn about Linux, say, and you want to put it on your computer, suddenly there's like a, you know, a whole room argument about which distribution is the best. Uh, and, and there's like three or four people who are kind of going, well, this is the best, this is the best, this is the best. And you don't know enough about this, and I do, and that's my power. I know more than you technically. It's, it's the privilege of knowing something, and it's exploited again and again and again, whether it be electronics, whether it be software. And it creates a barrier to entry because if you're not if you're not considered on their level, who do you go to help for? Who do you kind of learn from? Where does the skill sharing come from from that? Um, and this and, and that elitism can be in itself exclusionary too. And it wouldn't be surprised me if there were people who went to a hack space and 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 felt that and then decided, well, this is not a place for me. I should probably go somewhere else. Whereas I think that kind of Elitism should be put aside slightly in favor of the skill and the knowledge sharing. Hackerspaces should essentially be education centers. Maybe not formalized, but certainly informally, it's a place where we all go to learn. So I've come up with my own little bit of solutionism for, rep for recognizing the problems. Um, they only identify the issue. They're not going to solve it. To solve it, you need to get behind whatever particular part of, the, of, this, of this solution is. 
you can have a code of conduct, for example, and that's really great because you're saying, okay, we realize that harassment is a problem. We realize that all these little things are a problem. But unless you have people willing to execute on the code of conduct, to set up a process to um, uh, uh, deal with whatever comes up and give out the punishments that you've set, you're not really going to solve anything. All you're going to do is put the paper over the cracks. So I've come up with a term called interfaces because I wanted to take the concept of the design patterns we had. We have hackerspaces now. The design patterns don't really work anymore because they were, they were meant for hackerspaces that are starting. A lot of them are established now. You've been around for two to four years, maybe even more, especially in Europe. They've been around 10, maybe more. And you're kind of stuck in this rut and you can't, a lot, I'm guessing a lot of you want to fix it, but you don't know how, you don't know how to begin. And so these are some of my ideas on how to do it. You've got the code of conduct. I love the one for EMF camp. I think it's, it's general, but also very specific. It covers a lot. Um, and if you have a grievance process on, uh, alongside with that, you get to deal with whatever problems come your way in a, in a kind of fair and mediated way. The other things are things like uh, the no asshole zone, taken from the hacker school, I think it's in New York, where they have little signs on the wall saying, uh, don't do the well actually thing. You know, when you come in with a Raspberry Pi and it's, well actually, there's this other thing which is so much better because, you know, Richard Stallman and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. Don't do it. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's just not gonna help anybody. It's certainly not helping the person you're talking to and it's not gonna help you. Um, the, my problem with the hacker school is they, they, they screen people before they let them in. And they screen people for, uh, they call it being a jerk. It's an American term, don't know what it means. Um, and that's great, but if you're not being inclusive, then you have to kind of assess what are you doing, what is your community as a hackerspace if you're not being inclusive. Um, but I think they're no asshole rule set is interesting and again you have to enforce it when people do these things they might not realize they're doing it then they might need to kind of sit down and be told that they're doing it to kind of learn not to do it and you should give each other permission to do that um, the final thing I would say is you also need to negate part of the rules you have in a hackerspace things like duocracy don't really work because what you're doing is you're setting up a little fascist cult for whatever particular task you're doing to decide what function that kitchen is going to be used for and how it's going to be used. And that not, might not necessarily reflect the needs of the community in the space. So you need to have a more kind of, demo, I want to say democratic, but it's a dirty word. You need to have a more kind of um, inclusive way of doing these things. And it's a difficult thing, and things end up taking six months or a year to do. But the outcome at the end of it is, is, is much, much better. So that's, that's my very quick talk about the problems. Um, if you want to come and find me to talk about them more, please do. You can find me on Twitter. Go away, talk about it between yourselves. You need to recognize a problem. There's a few of them. Make a start. Thank you. Just an offer of a, another observation. Uh, when one key thing to a hackspace culture is this notion of individual agency, the, where the ideal is to create a space where people are individuals are empowered to take matters into their own hands and uh, and uh, set up things for for themselves, um, and that works really well in a space where everybody uh, has the confidence to do that uh, and feels welcome enough to do that, um, but. It's uh, and, and then and then we create uh, sort of behavioral patterns around that. For example, uh, strategic uh, ignorance or a, a strategic not listening to others, sort of to blur out the noise while you're focused on this task, uh, which which can empower you to to work more efficiently and so on. Uh, but but on the other hand, it, it also creates these these kinds of barriers uh, that you describe. So I, as as soon as I started noticing that uh, that, I also started wondering to what extent. Do some uh, key hackerspace values actually conf uh, stand in conflict with uh, notions of openness and diversity? Because some some of our uh, the ways in which we organize ourselves are actually opposed to inclusiveness uh, and and are uh, focused on individual agency. 
Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I think some of the uh, design patterns we have that were stated about maybe 10 years ago, was, is it now? Um, they were useful then for the culture that existed then. I think the, the hacker scene has kind of grown exponentially over the last few years. Um, and we've kind of lost the old culture in that kind of dilution. It's not been passed, enough, uh, passed on quick enough. And so there was a lot of assumed knowledge and, uh, and in the end, I think the hackerspace patterns have done as much damage as they have done uh, good. So yeah, we kind of we all need to sit down and kind of talk about it between ourselves and come up with a new, either a new framework or a new options of frameworks for our existing spaces and and ways to change them. But change is very hard, and especially cultural change. And I suspect it will be it will take years. So. Hello. Ah, awesome. Um, so. I like the idea of the no assholes. And I know that uh, pre-screening people seems a little tough based on their previous behavior, but if they've established patterns, you know, there's this, uh, Noisebridge has been using this principle of inclusivity through exclu exclusivity, that if you include people who are toxic, then it makes it actually more exclusive for a lot of people who are, like, a lot more people who may be uh, more um, adapted to working in a community. But um, I was wondering what the most successful one you've seen is because maybe it's maybe it is about policing the behavior that like well actually saying don't do that instead of your and asshole stay out um, and giving people more of a chance. Uh, to comment on the exclusion, I, I completely agree with you, but I'm I'm very scared of saying where is the line, who gets excluded and who doesn't and for what reasons and what criteria. It can be a little bit dangerous, and. You, people might not realize it, but it can strengthen the exclusion of minorities too. So if you do do that, you need to include the people who are represented normally in your space. You might have to go outside your community to do that. Um, the best space I've seen for diversity um, is probably one called Frack in Leowarden. I like it. It's a nice little space and a nice little city in the very far north of uh, the Netherlands. And there's a, quite a few women there, and the atmosphere is good, and the people get along, and I can't figure out what it is. Maybe it's something in the water. Sorry. A scale would be really good. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 again, I don't really have the answers to this. I'm just kind of popping up the question. Um, it strikes me as um, something that lots of groups have hit before. So it's interesting. Um, well, perhaps it's natural, we're all humans, so um, there's been groups of people collecting together for thousands of years, and, and certainly I've come from sort of, um, sort of party scene and sort of anarchist collectives, and you know, it's almost a standing joke when you look back at the 60s about endless meetings to solve problems, so it's not necessarily a new problem, so maybe there are lessons we can learn from previous groups, but do you think there's something different about hack spaces from previous what, what, what should we call this, community groups or hobby groups? Because there are certainly people who have come together on shared hobbies before or shared social interests. So do you see there's something different going on with hack spaces as opposed to these other groups which have been going on for tens of years or hundreds of years, um, people coming together around a shared interest? Yeah, I do. I'm completely naive in that view. I think there is something ever so slightly different that tips the balance towards possible change and possible uh, moments of self-reflection within the community. I don't know how to achieve that, though. I wish I did. I'm up for the conversation. <laughs> um, and with the London Hackspace, we have a thousand members, and for, for me, this is certainly a question of scale. Uh, we, uh, having observed the growth of our community, um, uh, I think uh, fundamentally uh, humans are quite bad at dealing with large groups and we stop feeling like we belong or like we, we stop feeling like it's our space, we stop feeling connected with people as we grow. Uh, one, one thing we did in the, in the London hack space to address uh, other issues, for example, we, we started having maintenance issues and so on and information flow problems and so on. One thing we started doing is fostering a stronger, uh, stronger uh, organizational models around subgroups where we have subgroups for particular activities who own particular uh, materials and uh, who have a, a schedule, who have contact people, who have organizers and so on. And I think that works really well. It's also a great approach to uh, introducing people to the organization because right from the beginning they have people 
to get in touch with, to ask questions, to, to feel welcomed and so on. Um, the, with the historic precedents, one, one thing I noticed in the UK that's quite different to European hackerspaces is there, for, for me as a, as a European, it seems like there's virtually no political awareness in, in UK hackerspaces, no political history uh, and, and, and even an unwillingness to engage in, in political discussions. Uh, in, in, in London for the longest time uh, people said, uh, we don't engage in politics, uh, politics just detracts from making. Um, which I think is a, is a silly statement, and it's also not uh, true in, in, a, in, a, in a number of ways. But it's, 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 it's also something where uh, this is a question of culture, and it's also a question of awareness. Politics does not have to mean uh, uh, party politics. Politics also means uh, an awareness of power structures, an aware, uh, awareness of organizational structures, and, and these kinds of things. Hello, uh, I'm from Edinburgh Hack Lab, um, and the issue of scale is interesting because we doubled in size in sort of 18 months or something like that. So we're now about three or four years old, and we started from 20 people, and as soon as we moved to a new space, we had loads more room, and we got double, more than double the number of members you know, in, in not much time. And the community definitely changed because at the start, there was sort of 20 people, and that was a good amount of people for going out for a curry or something like that because you, know, you can book a table for that size. When you get to 40-something people, you can't really do that. It just doesn't work, and it sort of starts to fragment, which is... I kind of thought that was a terrible thing, that it was just fragmenting and it's not the same as it was. But it's like, actually, who cares it's not the same as it was, as long as it's still good. So the patterns don't have to stay the same. I agree with what you were saying. You know, the patterns that we started with don't work when you scale up. And that's not a bad thing. We just have different patterns for different scale. That's okay. Um, the problem that, that we face, well, I think we have a pretty inclusive bunch of people. It's good. We've got, you know, we've got gay members. We've got a few female members. We've got a lot of foreign members. Um, and that kind of reflects Edinburgh because there's loads of you know, foreign students and things like that in town. But it still feels like a very white, male, middle class outfit. And it's a real shame that it's not more diverse. I think our problem is getting people in through the door in the first place to our open nights and things like that. Um, because you just don't seem to get that many more diverse people through. It seems to be the, the white male middle class people coming through the doors. So I wonder if you had any ideas on kind of that initial step of getting people in, marketing it or whatever, and you know, there's talk of like doing, doing special events that appeal to certain types of people, but so, uh, you know, I'm not keen on that so much. Two things, first of all, I personally think the magic number for change of scale in a hack space is around 50 members. Um, I saw it coming at Tech Inc, and I introduced things like subgroups early and no one understood it, and now they're like, oh yeah, we get it, we're 100 people big, it works. Um, and, I, and I really do think some insight needs to be done on different size hackerspaces and the rules they have. To answer your question, there's only one way to do it, and that isn't saying, oh, we've got an open night, come through our door, they're not gonna come through your door, they don't want your culture, they're not part of your culture, they don't want it, they don't fit in there. You have to go and get them. You have to go out, you have to find the people, you have to convince them to come in, and you have to be inclusive. And don't be a dick. Don't use your elitism of knowledge of technical skills. Don't be an asshole. Have a code of conduct so they know it's a safe place, they know if this is the trouble, they have a way of dealing with it. And that's the only way. You have to go and grab them by the arm. So is that the reason why it, it doesn't happen very often? Because yeah, it's completely. a massive effort. Look at London. It's in East, London hack space is in East London. You'd think there'd be quite a diverse... Um, representation given the area it is in and it's like five quid a month no tech inc same thing it's in an area which is very ethnically diverse we have the similar payment system it's there is it's all white hello hey. um i'm from the also hacker space and uh it's a very small hacker space and um we've had uh actually I disagree with the, the uh, point of scale here. We have a very small hacker space in the center of town and some really open doors and uh, a lot of people coming in from the street and most of those people are dodgy and not really interested in hacking at all. Um, really, and, um, and uh, it, I think it was a very good point you made that we should go out and find people to come in because we I, I also believe in the principle of inclusion and exclusion, as in you need to include the right people to foster a community spirit. And um, 
um, I was wondering how, in a small hacker space like ours, can we avoid having people do stuff and then ending up deciding everything about it, like avoiding the micro fascism that you were talking about. <laughs> the micro in a small sp well, it, how many members do you have? You have twenty. That's like a decent number. I thought I thought it might be like five or ten. Um, yeah, in small groups it's hard because the personal the personal relationships also reflect quite strongly on how the space is organized and what's done. You need to take a step back and do a bit of self-reflection and ask yourselves how you want to be organized and, and it's going to cause arguments. So you can go one route which is to formalize everything, formalize your processes, formalize your rules, branch out into a bit of voting maybe. Um, we played with liquid democracy at Tech Inc. Um, nothing official. I kind of like that idea for certain spaces and certain groups. Um, which is where you vote, where you specify your preference for a thing, and then when someone submits a vote for something, your preference is used rather than you ask for a vote, um, which bypasses the whole part participation thing because people just don't want to participate in votes. That's that's an idea. It's not the, it's not the answer. Try it. Experiment. Hackspace is great for experimentation. I've experimented in every one that I've been involved in, um, openly. Just do it. Final question. I think we've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, three quick. Okay. Got three minutes now. Cool. <laughs> Can, is it, yes. Um, I've worked in technology for about 25 years. I've lived most of my life in housing cooperatives, and I've worked in food cooperatives before as well. Uh, the smallest cooperative I was in, housing cooperative, was 15 people, and the largest was 200 people with a budget of 20 million pounds. Um, in, in, I can't think of a single cooperative that I was in that wasn't diverse. Um, all ethnicities. But all genders, all, <laughs> all sorts of people in these co-ops. I know that um, they've all got something in common, and that is that those people want to be housed or they want to be fed or something like that. Um, th there are technical aspects to this as well. We ha we've had women financial officers. I was the maintenance officer at that £20 million co-op. You know, I was in charge of actually getting stuff fixed. And uh, loads and loads of women would, would, would sort of come on board and... The only, I mean, you're talking about organisational structure. Well, the cooperative structure is very, very, very simple. You have, to be a registered co-op, you um, agree a bunch of policies, you get those uh, ratified, and that's what you work off. And every year you have an election for committee. You can actually make up whatever sort of, you know, positions on the committee you want. You can have whatever you like. Um, but it's a very, very simple thing, and it's very transparent, and it's, and it's very easy for people to get involved with. And we found that uh, it didn't matter if you were a co-op of 15 or 200, uh, and what size your budget was, that uh, because this, the process was so incredibly simple, uh, people tended to pitch in, so especially when there was a crisis. Now, you do get a lot of people sort of sitting back and letting a few people take on board and do things. So we found that what we'd do is we, you, could, you could engineer a small crisis now and then and say, well, we've got, <laughs> we've got a problem, this is every, you have to come because we, we might dissolve. People turn up, they get involved, and it gets <laughs> it sort of renews itself. So Tech Inc. Uh, is essentially a cooperative. It's called a Vereniging in, in Dutch, and it's an association. A co uh, uh, and a lot of all the other Dutch hackerspaces, uh, foundations or, or limited companies like they are, like hackerspaces in the UK, and they all laughed at us They're like, "You're mad. This is not going to work." I like it a lot. It has a side effect insofar as there's a, there's a whole bunch of rule lawyering by all the hackers and they come along to the AGM type things and, they sp and we spend six hours, I think the longest one was like maybe eight, uh, which, which, is, which is our fault. There are better ways to do it and I could talk about that if you want. Um, but yeah, I agree. No, that doesn't work either because they'll write, they'll write four page policy documents and then argue for three hours that it's correct. So next question. And this is kind of in response to your question about how to get more diverse uh, people in. And I think that excluding people, uh, excluding the jerks is, is great. But I think a lot of the problem comes from people who are, for the most part, think of themselves as, as good people. Yeah. But we all have biases. And if we don't yeah. try and examine ourselves, then we, we kind of behave in ways that might end up being excluding. So I would recommend start... Um, reading blogs by women in tech, start following people on Twitter who come from marginalised areas, see, kind of try and start examining your own biases and then that will hopefully um, lead you to putting on the right sorts of events that will actually attract the right sort of people. So, so one thing, uh, another thing I tried to start at Tech Inc, um, but failed, 
was a, a dispute resolution group. I think they have one now um, to handle. It's, it's by the members, for the members. It doesn't involve board members at all. Um, and I kind of like that because before you get to a grievance procedure, you can sit down with a couple of people who are having differences, whether personal or for whatever bias. And this is assuming you have the right people who are aware of these kind of cultural and society and systemic biases. You can kind of try and aim that, but it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It's a time sink. So, yeah. Okay, that was the last speaker. So, you thought you were going to finish early? I know. Okay, thank you for coming. You've been great.